It's good to be able to be together. You know, it's been a long time since we've been able to worship in our sanctuaries and our places of worship. For some of you, it's been since March the 7th and others of you since March the 14th. And there's nothing like being able to be together. But COVID-19 has redirected how we do worship. Many of us have experienced quarantine. In fact, it reminds me of a little note I came across the other day. And that is that a young boy, like about four or five, asked his dad, he said, Daddy, when, when you were a boy, were you quarantined for COVID-1 through 18? Well, obviously, he didn't understand, but it made logical sense to a little, a little young boy as he talked with his dad. And so it is that we continue to understand what it is as our group sizes were shrunk from 500 to 250 to 100 to 50, and now it's been at 10 for a number of weeks. And now we're learning what the new normals are about shopping, about wearing masks, about putting on gloves, and what it is to try to get to the store and try to find hand sanitizers and trying to find toilet paper or even flour, whatever it is within your area. This is our new norms. And we have gone from next day shipping to next week to next month, even down to back ordered, and in some cases, gone out of business. And so we are learning as well, what does it mean to be an essential worker or a non-essential worker? And for many, the experience and the restlessness that we're beginning to feel as, there are, as our uh, unemployment has risen from 3% to almost 30% the anxiety that that has brought, and so the, our assumptions, the models that we have used. There's been a lot of confusion that you and I are having to experience as we are going through COVID-19. And so it is, as we're wondering as well, when are our stores going to be able to open up? When are we going to be able to enjoy sporting events again? Or even going out and eating out in a restaurant. It's been a long time since we've been able to enjoy any of those items. And so it is that friends and acquaintances have experienced COVID-19. Some got pretty sick, but they recovered. Others didn't even know they had it, but others didn't make it, especially those in some of our uh, rest homes, nursing homes, and veterans homes. And for those, we want to continue to pray that God will be with those families who have suffered loss. But we also, at the same time, want to thank those of you who are our frontline workers, those who day after day, in spite of the COVID-19, are continuing to serve, and through the power of your touch, you are making a difference in other people's lives. Whether it's nurses or technicians or physicians or those who are preparing the food or the janitors or other individuals in our hospitals or, or maybe even those down at the local store who are serving us and, and stocking the shelves and are at the checkout stands on our behalf. For those who are delivering the mail, or even delivering those packages still to your front door, and even those who are collecting our garbage. We want to say thank you to those who are making a difference still in our lives. But even at our school level, our young people have experienced a new paradigm as well. That's called education. They're learning to do education over the, over the airwaves of called technology. Moms and dads are learning to be homeschool teachers as well as they, as they partner with our schools in order that our young people can continue their education. And even in our church life, we are experiencing prayer meeting or other kinds of prayer time online. And even on Sabbath morning, we're experiencing, just like we are today, an online worship service. We don't know when it is that we're going to be able to get back together in our worship services. But this is all in God's timing and in God's methods. And sometimes we see, have seen our worship services as the mission. Worship service is not the mission. What is the mission is that we worship. Worship service is the method to get to that mission. And so we've had to make adjustments. We've had to be flexible as we try to work through a time that none of us have ever experienced before. But to each of you, we want to say thank you for reaching out and touching other people, for encouraging other people, for praying for other people, and for finding ways to serve other people in uncharted time, in an uncharted ways. The devil, I believe, has meant COVID-19 for evil. But one of the things that God does so well is he takes our messes, our chaos, and can create a garden out of it. The devil may have meant evil, but God can turn this into a blessing. For the good news is, God has not been put on quarantine. 
And so I want to look at a, at a story today in the, in the Scriptures that talks about the power of His touch. And if you have your Bibles, whatever version you have, whether it's the text or whether it's an electronic version, I'd like for you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. That's the passage we want to look at. For in Matthew chapters 5 to 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is intentionally is saying, this is what He wills to do in us who will be His followers and His disciples. He wills to do that in us. In Matthew chapter 8, he begins, the, the book of Matthew begins to tell us the story of how that life of discipleship is lived out. And so we look at the first three stories there of Matthew uh, chapter 8, and there are three interesting miracle stories that are there, for they are miracles that are designed to tell a story, the story of how to reach those who are excluded or marginalized within culture. And so there are three. There is a leper, there is a Gentile, and there is a woman. And so it is that, according to Matthew, a disciple of Jesus will be concerned about any individual that is marginalized and find ways to touch those people. Like Jesus, the ministry of a disciple is not for the righteous, but for sinners. And an interesting note in this parables or these stories, these three stories of healing, is the last story about the healing of a woman Matthew makes a special note that the first person who served Jesus after healing was a woman. And so it is that Jesus breaks down the issues of purity, of ethnicity, and gender. And so as we look at this story, turn with me, if you will, now to Matthew uh, chapter 8, and I'm going to read through verses 1 through 4. Read along with me. And the Bible says, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly, a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and, and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. So now we have the main players in this story. There is Jesus. There is a nameless crowd. And there is a nameless, marginalized, excluded leper. In rabbinic literature, it is interesting to note that the topic that they dealt the most with in their literature was that of clean, unclean, and defilement. The worst of all of these was the despicable leper. Leprosy had the greatest defilement. In fact, there is no uh, accounting in rabbinic literature that suggests that they had any idea how to cure leprosy or even to bring relief. They were powerless. As one who has described leprosy states, it might begin with little nodules which go on to ulcerate. The ulcerate, or the ulcers, develop a foul discharge, and the eyebrows fall out. The eyes become staring, the vocal cords become ulcerated, and the voice becomes hoarse, and the breath wheezes. The hands and feet always ulcerate. Slowly, the sufferer becomes a mass of ulcerated growths. The average course of that kind of leprosy is nine years and ends in mental decay a coma, and ultimately death. Some leprosies take up to 30 years. It's a horrible progressive disease in which a man dies by inches. In Jesus' day, when, when you were declared leprous, you were a recipient of the full, utter heartlessness of the rabbis, and therefore the culture. For it was believed that, that not only were you diseased beyond cure, but that you were a sinner beyond forgiveness. There was no history of any Israeli ever having been healed of leprosy, just a Syrian general healed by Elisha the prophet some 800 years before. According to rabbinic law, you must loudly proclaim your social identity, the social tag that had been placed on you. You must call out, unclean, unclean. Also, according to rabbinic law, at all times you must keep a minimum of six feet of social distancing. 
and if there was a strong east wind, up to a hundred feet of distance. You must also wear a mask that was covering the upper lip down through the chin, a mask and six feet of social distancing. Does that sound familiar? You had to wear clothing of that of a mourner, clothes that were torn and your hair was disheveled. According to rabbinic law, you had to leave your community and you could not enter a walled city or any part of the temple compound. Anything that a leper touched or touched the leper was immediately defined as unclean. And so it was that a rabbis oftentimes would not even go down a street in a little town where a leper had recently been. They wouldn't buy eggs or anything from the market if a leper had been down in that area. If a leper got too close, the rabbis would pick up stones and would try to throw them at them. And if that didn't work, they would run away screaming at the top of their lungs. And so the life of a leper of total, complete isolation, no t touch, your social tag, your identity was unclean, unclean. According to E.W.G. Masterman, he writes, no other disease reduced a human being for so many years to so hideous a wreck. This nameless leper, this piece of human trash, unable to touch or be touched, this man for whom hell itself would be a welcome relief. But somewhere, somehow, this leper had heard about a rabbi, a new rabbi named Jesus, a rabbi who never turned anybody away who came to them, a rabbi who healed everyone who had come to him. And he began to wonder, could it be? So he tracked down where the rabbi was, and, and he found him. And he was hanging off on the side of, of an, a large audience. How much of the Sermon on the Mount he heard, I have no idea. Did he call out his identity to those people as he came close? We don't know. Maybe he was on the far fringes of that crowd as he, and heard Jesus teach that day. What we do know, that in spite of the crowd, in spite of, of all of the public disdain that he had, as Jesus was coming down from his teaching, in spite of the social tag of, of Mr. Leper, he decided to risk, risk the displeasure of the crowd, risk the displeasure of a rabbi. He was willing to take a risk. What we do know, according to Scripture, that there was a suddenly moment now. He knew that this was the moment. There was that, that overwhelming urge in him that now, now, suddenly was the time. For the Bible says, large crowds followed Jesus, verse 1, as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly, the Bible says, a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. There you have it, a nameless leper for whom there was no forgiveness. And there you have it, a crowd of observers who are absolutely horrified and they have now just forgotten the sermon that they just heard from the lips of the rabbi. And there you have it, an outcast, a broken, socially tagged, marginalized piece of human flesh kneeling before Jesus. Would this rabbi treat Mr. Leper like all of the other rabbis? Would this rabbi pick up stones and start to throw them at this leper? Would this rabbi run away screaming at the top of his lungs and the crowd following him? Before this rabbi responds, the leper speaks. And as the crowd draws back, the socially tagged Mr. Leper says, Lord, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. He was not asking just for physical healing. He was ho hoping for social. He was hoping for spiritual. He was hoping for mental healing. There's a lot that is wrapped up in these few verses that gives us a real insight into what was actually taking place. This leper, Mr. Leper, he came to, to Jesus, to this rabbi. He comes to him in humility. For he knows that his identity and his social tag make it very clear that he is a nobody. He realizes that he has no uh, expectations, that he has the right to ask for an audience with Jesus. He knows that what he is about and has asked for, no other person has asked for since the time 
of Elisha some 800 years before. Pride did not keep him away. It was humility that brought him to the feet of Jesus. He also came in faith. For he actually believed that this rabbi could do what no other rabbi could do. He came also with reverence. He came, the Bible says, and he knelt before Jesus. The word that is used here in the Greek is proskunein, which is the idea of someone worshiping before the gods. It was also describes the actions as well as the words that one would use in the presence of divinity. And there you have it. Utter brokenness before divinity. I imagine a tear of emotion begins to well up in Jesus as he senses that compassion is about to explode and create a scene that this crowd has never witnessed before. For you see, there is only one law that Jesus works from, and that is the law of love. There has never been a person that has sought Jesus that Jesus has ever turned away. Never. I hear the crowd gasp as Jesus steps inside the six feet of social distancing requirement. Immediately, Jesus is now defiled. I hear the crowd grasp again as, as Jesus reaches out to touch him. They can't believe what they are seeing. As Jesus reaches out and physically touches this piece of defilement, this marginalized, socially tagged piece of humanity. I imagine that Jesus reached out and took, took the man's chin and he lifted up his head until the eyes of Mr. Leper locked into the eyes of the great physician. And then I imagine that as, that as Jesus has lifted up his chin, he takes the other hand and he reaches down and he takes off the mask of Mr. Leper. And then to the question that Mr. Leper asked, are you willing? If you are willing, Jesus says, I am willing. Oh, the power of his touch. Jesus, by touching this nameless wreck, takes on himself the defilement of all of us. For it says in Matthew 8, verse 17, This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, which said, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. Oh, the power of his touch. Have you ever needed to be touched? I remember some years ago after my younger brother left home after college, my mother was experiencing this thing called the empty nest. Maybe some of you have experienced that. Soon after that, my wife and I, we left the area where I was pastoring and for a Sabbath afternoon and went over to see mom. As I got there, I remember my mother coming out and, and I put my arms around her as I usually did and, and I just hugged my mom. And she hugged me and hugged me, and I think she must have started to sense a little bit of discomfort as this hug drug on. And she stepped back with a little tear in her eye, and she said, you know, I miss the touch from those I love. It's hard being a single parent. I immediately reached out and grabbed mom again and just brought her in and, and gave her a hug and hugged her. There's power. There's power in touch. Recently, I had to take a family member who was suffering from what appeared to be many of the uh, major symptoms of COVID-19. And I remember taking the family member to the hospital. We went into the ER, and there was security we had to go through, and masks and sanitizations and all the rest of that. And the individual was put into the uh, waiting or into a room there in the ER. And different technicians and nurses and others were coming in and out, getting IVs hooked up and trying to stabilize this family member. After about five or six hours, the physician came in and began to ask other questions, noted all of the different vital signs, and said that it was going to be okay for the family member to go home. But I remember as the family member stood up, getting ready to leave, the physician stepped inside that six foot of social distancing and said, with a hand reaching around on a side hug, said, I think you're going to be okay. I think you're going to make it. Tears welled up in that family member's eyes, knowing of the reassurance of the physician. There is power in touch. As we look 
at this issue of touch. And if we don't like touch, that means that we're probably robots, or maybe even Mr. Spock's. We are not human. You see, Jesus shrank the social distancing of the marginalized. He took off the mask of the socially tagged. He changed the social identity. Why? Because he was willing. What is your social tag? Your social identity? Have you been pushing around like a homeless person, a, a shopping cart full of social tags and labels and identities? Have you been living out other people's expectations and not those of Jesus? Sometimes church people are really good at wearing masks because church people, we like to have, make sure our lives look perfect, like we have everything together, like we have, we're in control of all of it. But the truth is that church people who wear masks are living superficially rather than vulnerably, which leads to a lonely, hollow life, just like a leper. Or maybe you're depressed or low self-esteem or a workaholic or maybe a victim. Maybe you're angry. Or, or maybe you've gone through a divorce or you feel fat or ugly or unsuccessful. You're carrying shame. Maybe someone has said something to you that was really painful and hurtful, and you have carried this social tag. I have. I, I remember a little while ago, some years ago actually, and I remember the place. I, it was like it was yesterday. I, I can see the people in the room. I, I can remember the topic that was being discussed as far as how to take another step in, that we needed to take. It was a difficult decision that we needed to make. And someone that I looked up to and someone within that room said some very biting words, and I, I remember them to this day. And the words were, you don't have what it takes. Boy, that hurt. And I remember for years I, I allowed those words to kind of govern a lot of my decisions that maybe I didn't have what it took. But by God's grace, I learned to quit pushing that baggage around. And I lay it at the feet of Jesus and to say, if you're willing... The good news is Jesus is always willing, and through the power of his touch, he has healed me. Or maybe you like the social tag that you have or the identity that has been given to you. You're, you're known as a caring, motivated, always caring for others kind of a person. But your family knows the real you. You too are in need of the power of his touch. For you see... There is only one social tag, one identity that really matters. One that we should be focused on. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. The only social tag that matters, the only identity that we need to live our life from, is not what others say, but what God says, child of God. That is what the power of his touch does. He changes us and gives us a new social tag. One of the beauties of this story, and one of the things as I, as I studied through this story is, it's interesting who got healed that day and who didn't. The crowd did not get healed that day. It was the one who stepped out of the norms. It was the one who took the risk. It was the one who fell at the feet of Jesus. It was the one who took that suddenly moment. It was that person, Mr. Leper, that was healed. The one who was healed was the marginalized. And what I love about this story is that Matthew tells us exactly how long this whole process took of going from trash to wholeness. He gives us behind the scenes look at, at the response of heaven of how long it took for this miracle to take place. We know the inside details of heaven's response. The word, instantly. Does the crowd start cheering? Do they start singing hallelujah? Or do they remain in stunned silence? For they have witnessed something that they could never even dream about. In an instant, Jesus exploded their theory of leprosy. In a moment, he broke the taboo of defilement. By the touch of divinity, he gave Mr. Leper a new identity. In an instant, he took the social tag of human wreckage and made him a child of God. What I know 
was that through the power of his touch, Mr. Leper was forgiven, made whole, and given a new identity because he was willing. For this is the law of love. Oh, the power of his touch. And then as we follow through on this story and go to the next part, it's very interesting. Jesus gives a very interesting command. Don't tell anyone. Like, really? This hasn't happened in over 800 years. But Jesus continues on in the story. He says, now go show yourself to the priest and give the gift that, that Moses stated. Well, what did that entail? Well, what that would entail is that the leper would need to go from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem, some 80 miles. And then once in Jerusalem, according to Leviticus 14, it states that he would take about another eight days from start to finish under the priestly examination. It would involve two birds, scarlet yarn, hyssop and cedar branches, two male lambs and a female lamb. It would include shaving his head and all of the hair on his body at least twice. He would have to bathe several times, all under the examination and watchful eye of the priest. Do you ever think that Mr. Leper said, man, this is going to take eight days. How in the world am I ever going to travel 80 miles? And besides, how am I going to get all this stuff? I mean, how am I going to get the lambs? And how am I going to, to get the birds? Man, I think I'm just going to settle for leprosy. I don't think so. I think I believe in, in gratitude he ran all the way to Jerusalem. He found all the stuff that was necessary with a grateful heart, and he shocked the daylights out of the priest who had never been asked to give this kind of an examination. Oh, the power of his touch changed life. A different identity changed to child of God. And you can, through the power of his touch, be changed as well. Mr. Moore knows the power of touch. Or I should say Captain Moore. He is an Army veteran and was trained in his uh, work days as a civil engineer. On April 30 of 2020, Mr. Moore, Captain Moore, turned 100. Toward the end of his career, he suffered with cancer, but the hospital and the, and the physicians and the care providers helped him, and he is now and has been uh, cured of his cancer. But in his retirement, he also suffered with a broken hip. Now he is relegated to a walker. But he was so grateful at the way his care providers took care of him, he wanted to give back to them. But he didn't know what to do. And so he would go over frequently to the different units where he had been served, and, and he would complete, continue to tell the individuals there how much he appreciated, and he would visit the other patients who were on the ward where he had been. He was so touched by their care, he couldn't help but just say, how can I give something else back? He didn't know what to do. And then this COVID-19 thing hit. And he began to hear of what the, the, what the hospital needed was, you know, gowns and masks, and, and they needed a sanitizing, and they, there was a lot of other equipment that they would need. So he thought, I can raise some money for them. And so he... he concocted a plan up. He says, I think I can raise about $1,200. $1, That's going to be my goal. I know I'm 99 years of age, but I think I can do this. And so at the age of 99, this is what he thought he would do. On, on April the 8th, he decided, I will start and I'm going to walk 100 laps. Now I'll get about eight or 10 of those in a day. And the lap consisted of about 82 feet in his garden and he was with his walker, and he would push it along. He says, I can do this, and I'll see if I can't create my own walkathon and see if I can't get sponsors to help me raise money so I can tell those who touched me before how much I appreciated what they did for me. Well, just over a week ago, before his birthday came, he completed his goal. He had completed 100 laps for his 100 years of life. Well, when he finished his laps, he raised, well, it was not $1,200, but it's $23.7 million and counting. In fact, Captain Tom's daughter, Hannah Ingram Moore, said, we are absolutely floored by what has been achieved, but we're so happy, so humbled, and so proud. He is a beacon of hope in dark times and I think we all need something like this to believe in and it's for such an amazing cause 
I don't know where you are on your journey. But what I do know is that Jesus is always the beacon of hope in dark times. Maybe you've been pushing around a grocery cart full of baggage and social tags and pain. Maybe during this time of COVID-19 quarantine, maybe God is creating safe time for you to be able to have a suddenly moment and fall at his feet and say, if you're willing, I can assure you he is willing. He won't turn you away. Well, he will give you that new social tag, child of the king. Or maybe you're exhausted since you've been deemed an essential employee and, and you're also fearful though, will I catch the COVID-19? Will my family catch the COVID-19? Jesus is your beacon of hope as well. And in your anxiety and in your exhaustion, come to the feet of Jesus and say, if you're willing, he is willing and he won't turn you away. Or maybe you're one of those who, who are at high risk, you know, and you have to be quarantined because, well, you, we're just not safe to be out. And, and you have had to stay at home and you've wondered, is there anything I can do? Well, place your request before Jesus. He will probably start by asking you, uh, what do you have? Well, maybe it's just a walker, a simple garden path of 82 feet in the internet. Well, that's a great start. For through you, he will become a beacon of hope in dark times. Because your social tag is you are a child of the king. What I do know, wherever you are, Jesus' response when we come and fall before him is, I am willing. This is the law of love. So I anticipate that all over this area, wherever you are, there will be a lot of all of a sudden these suddenly moments when people sense the power of his touch and are willing to change. Moments that you allow Jesus to shine a beacon of hope into you. Let him lift up your chin and take off your mask. The power of his touch. Or maybe you, by the power of Jesus, will be a beacon of hope and encouragement to others because of the power of his touch. There is nothing as powerful as when there are suddenly moments in the church. You shouldn't be surprised, for the Holy Spirit isn't on quarantine either. Let us each come to the feet of Jesus and experience daily the power of his touch. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you still have that healing touch. It has not lost any of its power, any of its efficiency, Lord. It is still able to give us what we need. Lord, we do pray for healing. We pray for protection, Lord. We pray for good health. But Lord, we know that no matter what happens to us physically, as long as we are in the palm of your hands, we will be made well. We thank you, Lord, that that special day is coming, Lord. I pray that today we will find our courage and our strength and our healing and our hope in you. For we pray it in your name. Amen.